Very good. Well, thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Dentistry Academy. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shurgan, Dr. Quack, Dr. Sumner, Ziad, and then uh, I just met um, soon to be, I'm not sure if you're officially Dr. Gardy yet, uh, another Londoner, and so it's a pleasure to welcome you to the London dental community. I know a lot of you guys are not from London, but, uh, but I'm really excited about giving this presentation. We've been uh, working on it for quite a while. Um, and really, um, the, with Dr. Shergan and I, we were speaking about a month ago, and as we were trying to source PPE to keep our offices running, um, he ran by me this idea of doing a month-long CE webinar series, and I thought it was such a great idea. And then he shocked me when he asked me if I'd be willing to do one of the, uh, to do, to do one of the presentations and what topic would I like to present on. And right then I instantly knew that I wanted to help guide the next generation of dentists kind of get off to a running start. Especially because you guys have been hobbled by all this, this corona pandemic and all the troubles. And so I want to try to give you uh, some, some, some tools and tips and tricks on how to kind of guide through this, uh, this, this first few years, uh, this first period of your career. Me personally, I love mentoring and coaching uh, young people. I've welcomed into my practice and coached well over 100 high school students who are thinking about dentistry, um, undergrad students who are trying to get into dentistry, and of course, dental students who are about to graduate, and now they're trying to get their career started and they kind of need some advice and some guidance on doing that. And so I've been extremely blessed in my career over the years. Um, a lot of it was luck. Um, some of it was a little bit of hard work, and really the rest was just kind of sticking to a plan. So this talk this morning, and I'm going to try to keep it uh, under the timeline, and um, it's really geared towards dental students who are about to graduate. It's geared to the class of 2020, and it's geared to young dentists kind of in the first five years of their career. And so if you're a 20-year uh, dentist, uh, I'm sorry if this might seem either redundant or, or a waste to you, um, but I'll do my best to keep you guys entertained and keep you guys uh, informed. And so this, I've titled this talk, you know, What Would I Do Differently? But really, I'm going to try to draw, draw for you guys a roadmap. So I'll try to make this worth an uh, hour of your time. Let's see if this uh, works. There we go. So that's me. Um, for those of you who don't know, or I guess you have me right there on the screen. Uh, for those of you that are on, um, on Instagram, uh, you can follow me on Hask the Dentist. Um, if you're looking, if you want to follow my practice, Aria Dental Center, we have a handle there too. If you'd like to... Um, if you'd like to reach out to me, send me an email, ask questions, want to do some, uh, some mentoring. If you're in dental school, you are more than welcome to come into my practice um, at any point. You can come and watch kind of simple stuff or you can come and watch some of the, the more advanced uh, surgical stuff. So here's my agenda for the next uh, 45 minutes. And so let's talk about the first few years after your graduation. Uh, then we're going to talk about kind of what some of your career choices and how that's going to, um, how, how you can kind of help navigate and make those decisions. And then I'm going to focus on eight areas of dentistry that you really want to try to focus on. And those are, these are the eight areas that if you're able to get through all of those, um, I think it's going to help really make you a complete dentist. So I've got some acknowledgements that I have to make. So I want to acknowledge two individuals who really need special recognition for their efforts in making dentistry better for all of us. Um, I have to thank Dr. Shurgan and his, uh, his team at Dentistry Academy. In 20 years of practice, I have never met someone with such ambition, drive, passion, you name it, to grow and succeed in dentistry like Sham does. I mean, truth be told, I remember him when he graduated dental school and he was a newbie associate uh, right out of school and he came up and applied for an associateship with us over at Dove Dental Centers when I was a partner there. And I remember interviewing him, and, uh, and he left quite an impression on me, and I, and I gave him a, a really high recommendation with, with our senior doctor, who then hired him. Ever since, we've had countless meetings and planning sessions together over the years, and I would always ask him when he found the time to sleep or to get the creativity and the energy to go on and create these new projects. He is a disruptor in the true sense of the word. I mean, who else in North America took this COVID situation, the shutdown, and turned it into an opportunity for others by creating over 30 webinars for over hundreds of dentists and thousands of dentists to watch later on YouTube. So I've loved watching him grow and build his empire. I guarantee you he's going to be the next Amazon of dentistry. And I say you get on board. And uh, if not, you need to get out of his way because um, he's, uh, he's taken over dentistry by storm. And, uh, and I love him for it. So Sham, I love you. <clears throat> Second, this picture there is my good friend, Vic Chandel. 
he has been a crucial, <coughs> excuse me, Vic's been a crucial and integral part of my, my practice and my success. I mean, he has been by my side for my entire 20 year career. He's guided me through my associateship, my partnership, the purchase of my practice, the expansion of my practice, and every investment decision and business decision I've made over the 20 years. He steered me clear of bad ideas that I've, that I've come up with, and he's brought me great new ideas. Um, I know it's a little morbid to say, but my wife knows that if I were to meet an early and untimely death, the first phone call she makes is to Vic, and her, his number is actually in her phone. Um, and so nobody knows the business of dentistry in Canada like Vic does. And if he's not your advisor, then he needs to be. And not for his success, but for your own. So my heartfelt thanks to both of these titans of dentistry. And I love them dearly. And they're a huge part of, uh, of what I do. So a little bit about me. Um, I'm a London, Ontario born, uh, born and raised. Um, I went to Western University where I did my honors degree in uh, chemistry, I graduated in 96, and then I was lucky enough to get into the University of Detroit Mercy School of Dentistry and graduated in the 2000s. If you, uh, if you were to see my Facebook uh, posts, um, all of my classmates, we've been celebrating our 20 year anniversary last week. Last week was, uh, was the anniversary of our uh, graduation ceremony. And so pictures have been going back and forth. And so to all my UDM classmates, uh, congratulations and happy anniversary. And then so when I graduated dental school, I immediately went into looking for an associateship. I was sick of being broke. And so a GPR, or ADE, GD, just wasn't on my radar. Um, so I interviewed at a few offices and I settled on working at what later became known as Dove Dental Centers, where I quickly grew and I even became a partner in that practice. So I associated for five years in a large 10 operatory group practice. Uh, we had about four or five dentists working there at any given time. And it was a great, phenomenal learning experience for me. Um, but after about five years, uh, I was kind of craving something different. Uh, I was kind of craving my own uh, style of dentistry. I wanted my own practice. I wanted to do things my own way. And so I kind of had this vision for a much calmer, quieter, simpler solo practice. And at that time, my senior dentist, um, he was starting to build multiple offices and he was building smaller four operatory practices in and around London. And I said to him, listen, I want to buy one of these. And uh, so five years after graduation, I bought my, uh, my first and only practice and life's been, uh, life's life was great. And so it was me, my assistant, one hygienist and one business assistant. And if had it stayed like that for the rest of my career, I would have been the happiest guy. But then the years go by and we get busier and we grow organically and we're adding another hygienist here and, and then a third hygienist. And then we, we just started to run out of space. So then I had to tear out my personal office and, uh, and create the fifth operatory uh, to allow for my third hygienist. And so we continued to grow and we ran out of space again. And so then I had to start really seriously thinking about what was I gonna do? Was I gonna look for a new practice or a new location? And then luck kicked in. And in my career, luck has kicked in many, many times. And, uh, and then the hair salon that was right next door to me shut down. Um, and it was a no brainer for me so we expanded we took that space we expanded into it and we've doubled the size of my office and it really it's put my practice into to growth mode and so now uh, we've rebranded we've uh, we've turned into aria dental center i got i have 10 operatories i have two full-time doctors myself and my associate dr laura merzai we have four hygienists we have an implantologist that comes once a month hello dr pierre obide who's on here um, and we have an, uh, an orthodontist and for you Western grads, you guys all know uh, Dr. Ali Tassi, um, my best friend growing up and he comes and does all my ortho. So this is my team. This is my work family. Um, you know, I, I love them. I, I miss them dearly. We haven't seen each other physically in almost three months. Um, but we do, you know, like most of you, we, uh, we stay together. We, we do those weekly Zoom meetings just to help keep up and keep our spirits and morale high. And we're just waiting for Doug Ford to give us uh, the green light to go back to work. And so Dr. Sony yesterday, he was going through and uh, showing you pictures of his office and I felt kind of jealous. And so I feel like the need to kind of show my office also. And so this is the, the result of our expansion from last year. This is my reception area and our waiting room. And uh, this is kind of the hallway then along the new expansion side. And these are our operatories. Now, this was not skill. Again, super luck. The college says you need enclosed rooms with doors. Well, I got lucky. I've got 10 enclosed rooms with doors. So if anybody in London uh, wants an ex and a couple of extra operatories to come work out of, 
you are more than welcome to, uh, to join. Um, this is my favorite room. This is our surgical suite. Uh, we built this one to be extra large. Um, and it's great. This is where we do our implant surgeries. We do sedation. We do, uh, we do our wisdom teeth. We do six-handed dentistry. And so it's been a great, uh, probably my favorite room in my practice. And of course, we have, every, every office has to have one of these fancy areas to keep in compliance with all the IPAC regulations that we have. And so, all right. So 26 years ago in 1996, it's my very first day of dental school. And the dean assembles all the students in one of the lecture halls and he goes, uh, goes about creating a, he gives us about an hour long pep talk. And so he's welcoming everybody into the program and he's, and he's giving us a pep talk about wonder, what a wonderful profession we've entered into and he's getting us really excited about our futures. And in that whole hour, he said really one thing that was really profound to me that has stuck with me all these years and it has been a guiding principle for me in all of my career and business decisions. And he said, if you stick with the practice of dentistry, you will have a long and prosperous career and be able to retire very comfortably. Now, he didn't really elaborate too much on that, but what I took from that, what I interpreted from that, is that you don't need to get into risky business ventures. You don't need to look for get rich quick fixes. You don't need to kind of jump into every business or investment opportunity that your, your friend or your colleague or a cousin or a cousin of a cousin recommends to you. Trust me when I say, if you stick with dentistry, you will do very well professionally and financially. So you've, congr you've, you've graduated. Congratulations. The class of 2020, I think you guys are all officially doctors now. And so what's next? Um, the first thing I have on here is humility. You really need humility. Um, don't be that cocky associate that thinks they've graduated dental school and they now they know everything and just get out of my way and give me the patience. Um, I've seen many, many new dentists over the years be like that and they crash and burn early and they crash hard and sometimes they even end up in front of the college in the hot seat and you really don't want to go there. So go into your first associateship, go in with a sense of humility, go in knowing that you don't know what you don't know and go in with a desire to learn and to get better. And so like most of your uh, classmates, you're going to go in and you're going to work as an associate. Again, I'm sorry if I'm a little, uh, little mean, but don't be a prima donna and, and expect easy hours and easy cases and easy, uh, and easy working situations. You're there to work and to learn and to start to pay down your debt. You're going to work long hours. You're going to need to work on weekends and you're going to need to work in the evenings. You're going to work on government patients. Sorry to say, but you need to pay your dues. I mean, when I first started, um, I frequently worked 12 hour days. Uh, I worked till 8 or 9 p.m., usually about two, three times a week. Um, I would work three out of four Saturdays for the first few years, and it, it's not meant to be a punishment. It's really just that you need to get your hands into as many mouths in as quick a time as possible to get your skills and your speed up. So you can get to the point where you can start really producing and being profitable at a productive clip. So next, you need to build a team around you. Now, I'm not talking about your assistant, your hygienist, and your front desk. No, I'm talking about your financial team. And you need a good accountant. You need an accountant that knows dentistry and, and, and the, the business and the, the accounting issues that were uh, for dentists. And then you need a financial advisor. Uh, I told you guys who my financial advisor is, and if he's not yours, then I think you need to reconsider that. You need a lawyer and you need a banker. Now, the fifth person I mentioned there is your dental service, your dental supply provider. Pay attention to this person. Do not shoo them away as some dentists do. Um, quite the opposite. You need to cultivate a strong relationship with them. They know what's going on around you in the dental community. When you're in a solo practice or in a small group practice, you live in a bubble. You're blind to what's going on around you. Your rep is your eyes and ears to what's going on in your community. They can help you in so many ways. They can help you find associateship positions. And if you're a practice owner, they can help you find associates. They can help you find staff. They can guide you towards good CE courses. And trust me, they will save your ass numerous times when you have just realized you finished your last uh, composite carpeal, or you've run out of impression material an hour before you've got a large crown and bridge case. Now, I have to give hats off to my rep, Shannon Arts from Henry Schein, and to Aaron O'Donnell, uh, the manager, the new manager there at uh, Henry Schein. Shannon has been with me for years, and she is a vital part of my practice. 
and she was all the expansion stuff that you saw there. She had a huge role to play in the design there. So big love and thank you to, to Shannon. And uh, so yeah, so take the time to build that relationship with your rep, because trust me, it will pay dividends for you many times over. And the last thing I mentioned on here on this list, and really it's, it's probably the most important because it's on the second one, and that is of mentorship. So when I was in dental school in Detroit 20 years ago, we kept hearing from our professors and from other dentists about the 10 year rule. And even when I started associating with uh, Dove Dental Centers with my mentor, Dr. Merritt, he used to frequently say that it takes, about, takes a new dentist about 10 years to really get a solid grasp of general dentistry and to become a complete dentist. And I would say that for my generation of dentists, that timeline was pretty accurate. But if you fast forward to the class of 2020, everything I learned in dental school 20 years ago is obsolete now. Nothing is the same today as it was from when I graduated. Materials, restorative designs, treatment planning, technology, endo, they are all fundamentally different today than from what I learned 20 years ago. We even extract teeth differently now than we did 20 years ago, the way we approach extraction. So dentistry has grown and evolved so much. And so a new grad might be intimidated and say, there's no way I can get this done. I can learn all this in, uh, in 10 years. It might take me 20 years. And I actually say the opposite might be true. And uh, I would suggest because you guys have tools and resources that you guys can get this done in five years. That's an ambitious goal, but I think it's a goal that you should really try to set. You guys don't, you guys have the things that we didn't have. We never had all this wonderful CE. We never had the mentors. We never had um, all of these resources, both online and in person that you guys can benefit from. And you guys can really just skyrocket with your experience and really become that complete dentist in five years. So you need to find a job where you have a senior doctor that can teach you and guide you in real world dentistry. And for me, you can see the picture there. That is Dr. Merritt. Um, he was my senior doctor um, for, for many, many years. He took me under his wing as a newbie skinny brown kid um, from the University of Detroit Mercy. And he took me and, he and treated me like a son and he taught me so much. Uh, we lost him four years ago, but uh, and we miss him. But he's left a legacy of great dentistry with his patients and his students. And among his students are not only myself, um, but Dr. Shurgan, as well as even Dr. Rondinelli, who you're going to hear from later on this week. I like to say that the three of us are graduates of the Merritt School of Real Life Dentistry. Next, there we, <coughs> excuse me. Next, we have continuing education. Continuing education is everywhere. It is plentiful and in all aspects of dentistry. You don't have to find it; it will find you. I don't know about you, but this COVID shut me sh shut down has me feeling like I've been drinking from a fire hose. I can't keep up with all the quality CE that's been flooding the dental community these days. And thank God most of it's been recorded and posted on YouTube, but it's so good and it's been such high quality and it's not just the Dentistry Academy series. It's been, I mean, if you're on Instagram, you are just getting bombarded with all these wonderful opportunities and lectures being put on by some of the most amazing clinicians in North America and even in Europe. So lastly, there have to take advantage of existing modalities. And so if you're an associate in a, in a practice and they have things that you, tools and equipment and, and modalities that you're, you haven't learned about or you're not used to using or seeing, learn them, use them, play with them. Here's, here's the best part of it. You don't have to pay for it, it's free. So if they have a laser, figure out how to use it. Ask, ask for help how to use it. There, there's online courses to use it. If that office does implants or ortho, you know, jump on that impl implant and ortho bandwagon and start learning how to do that. Um, if they have CAD CAM, you, want, you really want to start learning that. So if they have microscopes, then you need to be jumping on endo. And we're going to talk a lot more about that shortly. So before we get into career choices, this is kind of an important slide uh, for me. And you're going to see this twice. So you have to decide, what is dentistry for you? And this is going to help you guide, uh, your, again, your career choices. Is dentistry your life? Or is dentistry a means to enjoy your life? I mean, how much time are you willing to spend on your practice? Now, in your earlier, younger years, that, that is probably gonna be a lot, and maybe it should be. But when you're thinking long-term, you really need to start focusing on what are the things that matter to you. Now, I'm gonna to pretend to be Vic Jindal for, uh, for a couple of minutes here, but uh, my disclaimer is I'm not a financial planner, but uh, I'm gonna give you a little bit of financial advice. 
how much money do you really need um, when, you, when you kind of plan, plan your career and plan your, your career opportunities out? On the right here, there's a book. This book is written by Mark McNulty. It is an ebook. Um, Mark is a financial uh, advisor in the GTA area who deals exclusively with dentists, and he wrote this book back in 2015, titled The Six Million Dollar Dentist. And in this book, he makes the point that if you can accumulate six million dollars in investable assets for your retirement, then you've reached financial independence and you can retire if you choose. Um, and you can live a very comfortable life. So I took that as, for me, as $6 million was kind of that magic number. Now, the book goes on to also say that 70% of dentists don't come close to that mark and they end up retiring with less than $3 million. And to me, that was, that was kind of shocking. Um, so I highly recommend you get this book. You can kind of, you can just Google Mark and uh, send him an email. Um, it wasn't expensive uh, at all, and you can probably get through it in a couple of nights. But the key is to kind of set a goal for yourself and, and to work towards that goal, that goal and to track your progress. So my advice, set a high goal. Set your goal at $6 million, and the younger you start, the better. And I'll be honest, it is a very, very achievable goal, in my opinion. So how do you get there? So you need to meet with your financial planner and create a plan. So like I said a few times already, my guy is Vic Jindal and Jindal Financial all the way to my last day. And so I always looked forward to my annual meetings with Vic. And at that meeting, he spends the first 20 minutes going over all of my insurance portfolio and all my investment portfolio and how they're doing. And really I go into that meeting knowing all that stuff already because I open my statements, um, like even though most people don't, and I, and I look forward to, uh, and I look to them and I see what, uh, where we're at. But that's not the part that I look forward to. I'm there to ask him three questions and Vic can attest to this. These are always the three questions that I'm asking. Number one, are we on track to meet our goal? Whether that goal is 3 million, 5 million, 10 million, whatever it is. And if we're not on track to meet that goal, what do we need to do? What changes do we need to make to be able to get back on track? Number two, I wanna know how I was doing compared to my peers. Um, I wanted him to rank me. I would ask him, Vic, where do I rank among all of the, you know, the young dentists in, uh, in, in the community here in London and Toronto? And he would give me the real hard truth. He would not spare, he would not spare any, there was no BS. And the reason I needed to know that is again, I lived in a bubble. You live in a bubble. You don't know what you don't know. And so you don't know what dentist across the street is doing or what you might be doing. You don't know how to benchmark yourself. So I always asked him uh, what his top performing dentists were doing and if they were doing something that I wasn't doing. And if I wasn't doing it, then how can I get on that uh, and make that happen? Then number three, I would always ask, what's next? How can I grow professionally and financially? And every time he would walk me through the steps uh, that I needed to kind of take to, in order to kind of progress in my career, and I'll give you an example. Um, after about five years of associating, I was kind of on cruise control. I was happy. I was doing well financially. But then he said to me, dude, why are you still an associate? You need to be moving on to the next level. You need to get your own practice. So from that day, we put together a plan on paper and uh, we made that happen. And then it was about a year later when I had my practice. So how are you going to get to that level of financial independence? And so almost all of you are going to start out as an associate for a few years um, and you're going to gain that experience. You're going to benefit from that wonderful mentorship. And there is nothing wrong with associateship. Do, don't be shy to consider associateship as a permanent career choice. There is tremendous benefit to not having to deal with all the headaches of owning your own practice. And the income you can gain from being an associate can provide a high quality of life for you and your family now and well into retirement. I mean, it's simple math. If you're producing $40,000 a month as an associate, you're taking home 200 grand a year. And if you're a higher producing associate in a practice, then you're earning 300 grand a year. But then most dentists kind of strive to own their own practices. They want, they want to be that single practice owner. They want to build their practice. They want to do dentistry their way, and they want to make their own decisions. But with that ownership comes responsibility. And what I mean by responsibility is you're not just responsible for your own mortgage, but you're also figuratively responsible for the mortgage of all of your employees. I mean, you need to learn and develop 
leadership and man management skills. They don't just come naturally. Um, my a strong suggestion, take 45 minutes and go on YouTube and watch Simon Sinek's TED Talk called Leaders Eat Last. It will give you a true taste of leadership and empathetic leadership. I'll give you an example. Um, when Corona shut down all of our offices three, almost three months ago, Dr. Shurgan, Sony, uh, myself, and a few others, we would meet regularly um, by phone, and we would try to figure and come up with strategies on how to keep our staff whole financially during the shutdown, because they had a lot of anxiety, even because they were all laid off. And so I remember making a, 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 a solemn promise to my staff that I wasn't going to take a penny of pay for myself out of the office until they were all hired back to work and making money again. And that if anybody was having any financial difficulty, they need to let me know. And I would do whatever I could do to help them out. And that way, because I wanted them to sleep at night knowing that they didn't have to worry about money. And for me, that was, um, that was important. And I think for my staff too, that was important. I think that, that offered them a lot of relief because again, we're all just one big family. And then you need some basic financial skills. Um, so in the early years of running my practice, I had a pretty simple and maybe even silly philosophy. Um, I would practice dentistry, money would come in, I would pay my staff and I would pay my bills. And as long as there was a decent chunk of money left over at the end of the month, then I was happy. That was for me. I didn't know anything about KPIs uh, or how to read a balance sheet or an income statement. As long as there was money in the bank, we were good. And that business management style worked really well for me for probably the, about uh, 10 to 15 years. And so owning and running a solo practice can be pretty straightforward if you just kind of stick with some simple uh, principles. So multiple practice ownership. And this is a bit of a sensitive topic for me. Um, and so I'm going to try to do this delicately. And so back in January, again, Vic, that's why I say he's such a titan, he organized a great and successful conference called Dentistry Disrupted. Unfortunately, like Dr. Sony, I had hockey dad duties, and so I was out of town, I wasn't able to attend. But thankfully, all the lectures were posted on YouTube not too long ago, and I watched every single one of them intently. And the conference really was highlighting some of the exciting changes happening in dentistry, and the people that were leading those changes. And many of those speakers have actually been part of this webinar series, so I encourage you to, to go back and even watch those videos again. And I was wowed, I was blown away, I was impressed by the speakers and what they were able to accomplish in such a short time. But then a few of the speakers were discussing their path to multiple practice ownership. And I felt a little uneasy because they almost made it look easy. They almost made it look cookie cutter. And I was, after watching all those lectures, I was left asking myself if the next generation of dentists were really going to see this as the new model of success in dentistry. Now, I don't have the slightest criticism towards any of these multi-practice corporations. Many of them are my friends and I have the highest respect for what they've been able to achieve because I'm telling you, I couldn't have achieved it. But I'm hearing from, from a lot of young dentists more and more that they feel now that they need to own and build multiple practices to be successful in dentistry. And so I'm here to respectfully tell you that that's just simply not the case. You can achieve tremendous success in dentistry just as a single practice owner or even as an associate. Now, why? Multiple practices, they're risky. They're not easy. Um, I know of several that have failed just in, uh, here in London. I know, I know it's been a model in the 1980s. There was a, a group called Tridont that tried for a few years and they failed and went under. I have friends locally that built or purchased satellite offices only to regret it later because of all the extra work and the headache involved. And me personally, I was involved with, uh, with Dove Dental Centers. This was a, a large nine practice uh, group and I got to see behind the curtain how it really works. And it's fraught with risk, stress, countless, countless hours and management and HR issues. And so again, going back to Vic and one of, my, uh, one of my annual visits with him and I would say to him, okay, Vic, what's next? And he said, well, the next thing for you is you need to get into a second practice. And that's when I put the brakes on. That is the only time I didn't follow Vic's advice because I just knew it wasn't for me. And so early on, I made a conscious decision many years ago that I didn't want to get into multiple practice and that I was going to focus on building and maximizing the practice that I had. Now, I'm not trying to discourage you. I just want to open your eyes to it. Now, if you want to get into multiple practices, you just need to prepare now. Um, you need, on top of all the dentistry, you need advanced business and management education. 
running multiple practices successfully does not happen by chance. You're definitely going to want to consider doing a mini MBA or an executive MBA, just like Dr. Shurkin's doing right now. So I go back to this slide. What is dentistry for you? What do you want um, out of dentistry? Is dentistry going to be your uh, consume your life or is dentistry a means to enjoy your life? And so for me, dentistry has offered me tremendous freedom um, with, with my time and allows me to give more time and energy to my family and to these other organizations that I love and they're so important to me. Um, this picture here, this is my family. Uh, I have three kids. Um, this is us in uh, Nassau, Bahamas. We always try to go uh, away for Christmas, either to Nassau or Orlando. And if you look closely, you know, I'm on my tippy toes there um, because my son thinks he's taller than me. And I didn't want to have, let him have that picture where, uh, where he could hold that against me. And so what else do I do with my time? Um, I like to dabble in things that you're not supposed to dabble in. I dabble in religion and politics. Uh, my parents founded the mosque many years ago, and I've served as the director and the president of that mosque for almost 15 years. Um, I serve as a director, policy advisor, and fundraiser for the Liberal Party of Canada. I'm on the board of directors for King's University College, and as well, I co-chair the Nazim Kadri Foundation, where we raise money for mental health organizations in, the community, in our community through our annual golf tournament and, and other sporting events. And so all of these things are only made uh, possible uh, through dentistry, and these are the, the things that dentistry has been able to, to allow me to do. So we're going to switch gears here a little bit, and now we're going to talk about eight areas of dentistry um, that I, I want you guys to, to kind of focus on. These are the areas that uh, are going to allow you to really become a complete dentist. Now, not all CE is the same. Many of the CE courses you find are going to be a short one hour one, like a webinar uh, here, or a, a full afternoon or a full day. Um, so there may even be a weekend course. So the shorter courses, they're great. And you're going to pick up a couple little curls, a couple little tips here and there. You're going to take those back to your office and they're gonna make your life a little bit easier. But the courses that I'm talking about here in these eight areas, you really need to wanna to get into more comprehensive and in-depth courses. These tend to be three to four day weekend courses or some of them are much more intense where you're doing four to 10 weekend courses spread out over months or even a year. And so look for those courses that really take you deep into that field. Now, they're not cheap. Um, they're gonna require different levels of, of investment. But look for the ones that have hands-on experience, or even better, find the ones that give you live patient experience, um, either on the patients they provide you from the course, or ones that you can bring in from your own, from uh, your own patient list. So number one, relationships and customer service. There is no point learning great dentistry if you don't have someone in the chair to do the dentistry for. You have to realize that your patients have choice. Um, it's not like in the hospitals where the medical specialists and customer service uh, is almost non-existent. Um, if you don't meet or exceed your patient's expectations, they won't hesitate to go to the dentist down the street. So take the time to build a great patient experience. You guys are lucky. My friend, Dr. Sony, yesterday laid out a beautiful presentation on how to master that first new patient experience. There, you need to build trust. You need to build a relationship with your patients. You are not just looking at teeth. Now, case presentation is not a skill that's innate, um, and it's not well taught in dental school. And still to this day, I really haven't come across a course that I would recommend to you guys that teaches this very well and in a comprehensive manner. But over 20 years of experience, I've learned a few things. And this is gonna make Dr. Sony and some of the other senior doctors that are watching this cringe a little bit, but this is my truth and it's worked for me over the years. I'm very much a minimalist type of a dentist when it comes to treatment planning and case presentations. So let me give you an example. Mr. Jones, an older gentleman, he comes in as a new patient to your office um, and he comes in for a cleaning, a complete exam and a cleaning. And you look inside and he's got a mouth full of older, large amalgams that probably eventually all just need crowns. And so he made it a point to tell my receptionist on the phone and to tell the hygienist during the exam that he came because the other dentist they saw not too long ago tried to sell him a $15,000 treatment plan on work that he didn't perceive that he needed. And he left. So knowing that, I completed the complete examination. And if his perio is stable, we do his cleaning for him. And then I give him a treatment plan that takes care of his perio, 
any active carries and his chief complaint. That's it. We, I will take him on a tour of his mouth. Um, we'll, we'll show him the photos and uh, we'll show him that he's got some large fillings on his teeth and that they're older and that you know, they're starting to, uh, to, to go past their expiry date and they're needing to be, to be replaced at some point. But they don't have to be replaced now. They could be done at some point in the future. We can gradually uh, build into that. And so he's happy. He leaves my office with an $800, $1,000 treatment plan. And guess what? I now have this patient for life. I have years to build that trust and to build that relationship with that patient to figure out what makes him tick. And I'm going to get all that dentistry done, but it's just not going to happen all at once. And it's going to happen over several years. Me personally, I've never been successful at presenting those big treatment plans. So as a result, I have 3,500 active patients in my practice and they trust us with their oral health and if Mr. Jones shows up and he breaks one of those teeth before we're getting around to crowning it, well, he's going to remember that conversation that we had. And he's going to remember that we talked about eventually that tooth needing a crown. And in his mind, well, now it needs a crown. And so I didn't have to sell him a crown. He came wanting a crown and he knew it needed to be done. And we, we get it done. The vast majority of the crowns that I do each month in my office are single units. Um, I don't do very much full mouth uh, and I do a little bit of, uh, of quadrant dentistry, but the vast majority of the crowns that I do, they're single units and they usually come from an emergency of a broken, you know, broken restoration or a broken cusp. So let's move on to, uh, to the patient experience. So here I've kind of listed three books for you guys. Um, these are books that I really recommend that you read. Um, these books talk nothing about dentistry but everything in these books have huge and powerful applications to dentistry. I'll give you a short story. On the right there, you see the book, uh, The Gold Standard. Um, it's the Ritz-Carlton uh, experience from the Ritz-Carlton Hotel. So I'm a big fan of the Toronto Maple Leafs. Uh, we go to watch our good friend, Nazem Kadri. And so I go to a lot of Leafs games every year. And one weekend we decided to splurge and we, we booked a, a room for a couple nights at the Ritz-Carlton downtown Toronto. So we checked in and then we went out to dinner and we went to the game and Nas scored a goal and we came back late at night. And the front desk staff that was there was a completely different front desk staff than the one that checked us in. And when we got there, I was blown away by, they addressed me by name, they knew who I was, they knew where I went, that we went to the game, they knew that we were cheering for Nas and they knew that he got a goal. How did they know that? I was blown away and it, and it, it, it stayed in my mind all night and we went and checked out the next day i made a point to ask the manager how did they know that and he kind of smiled and he laughed and he said at ritz carlton we make it a point to know as much about our guests as possible and to provide that ultimate customer experience um, I, I was wowed by that and so it, these are the things that impress customers and patients by going well above and beyond. And so I went and bought the book and I've gotten so many pearls on how to create that wow experience. And then I found these other books. I mean, who puts on better customer experience than Starbucks and Disney? And so there's so much that you can learn for, from, for your practice and for your business just through these, uh, this type of reading. Number two, molar endo. So take the time to learn molar endo. This is bread and butter dentistry. I know you don't get to do many molar endos in dental school, but you need to build a proficiency with molars. Most endos that I do in my office are molars. They're not the single rooted teeth. And not only is it an important service for you do for your patients, but secondarily, it's very profitable and it's very productive for your practice. At the very least, you need to be able to open up that molar and do an emergency pulpectomy. Then you can refer that emergency off to the endodontist, but at least you've gotten that patient out of pain and you've become a hero. So to get practice, take those, uh, those molars that you extract, hold on to them and practice your access opening. Practice looking for MB2, start using loops. And if your office has a microscope, get on it. Uh, MB2 is the key to, to molar endo. And so you should learn to love molar endo like I do. Now for me, I have the microscope. I use ultrasonics to trough and find those MB2s. And if I can't find them, or if it's a tough case or a retreat, then I'm sending them off to the endodontist. And my endodontist here in London, uh, he knows that if he's getting a case for me, that he's gonna be working for his money that day. And so here's uh, two mentors that put on really good courses in the GTA. And they are Gary Glassman and uh, Menor Haas. So I've taken both of their courses 
And a funny little tip for you is that I actually repeat these courses every five years or so. Why? Because everything's changing. Uh, materials change, techniques change, the science change changes. And so you, I, I take these courses um, frequently um, just to kind of stay updated and stay on top of things. So sedation, moderate oral nitrous IV. Um, so early in my career, I took the medical emergencies course uh, for oral and uh, nitrous moderate sedation at the U of T with Dr. Daniel Haas. And um, now I think you, the new grads at, in Toronto and Western, I think you guys are being offered to do this course right out of school. And I think that's a great move. I know my associate, Dr. Laura Merze, uh, she took the course and she's been doing it. She's been getting along really well with sedation now in the office. But here's my take on it. Um, for the last 20 years, there's very little in dentistry that I couldn't do just with oral nitrous moderate sedation. Um, and I do frequently wisdom teeth, implants, even all on X cases, only with oral moderate uh, sedation. But there's that rare patient where you really want or need GA. And how do I handle that? Well, I have an anesthesiologist who's a friend of mine just down the road, and um, he's able to come by. I have the facility license, and he can do the GA right in my office. Um, it's not cheap, but if you're doing a larger case, uh, it definitely becomes uh, worthwhile. But if you want to get into advanced surgeries and implants and you want to kind of go further uh, in your career, then yeah, I, I would recommend and suggest that you get into the IV uh, sedation course. I actually had signed up to do it last year, but it was, uh, I had a conflict with another surgery course I was doing. So I was signed up to do it next month um, at U of T, but then kind of Corona put, put a stop to that. And so if you're planning on taking uh, this course the next couple of years, you might see me there. All right, number four. Hope I'm not boring you guys so far. Extractions and wisdom teeth. Being proficient in dental surgery and extractions doesn't come from a course, it comes from experience. Um, you can read all the books and watch all the videos, but this is one where you need to get your hands dirty and you need to learn from your mistakes and constantly be pushing that envelope. Because there's no worse feeling, and it's happened to me, ask me how I know, um, when you're struggling with a tooth, you're sweating, patient's uncomfortable, you can't get that tooth out. And what do you do? You throw in the towel, you admit defeat, and you stop. And then you gotta go down the hall and you gotta pick up the phone, you gotta call your oral surgeon, you gotta beg him for a favor for him to kind of squeeze in your patient into that day. You feel awful, you feel like a failure, your patient's been inconvenienced, and you've had to make that humiliating phone call. But if you're lucky, you're gonna have an oral surgeon that's gonna take your patient right away and is gonna help him or her. And that oral surgeon is still gonna make you look good doing it because he's gonna tell your patient that that was a really tough tooth. Um, he was even, even tough for me. So I'm surprised your dentist was even able to, to get that far. And he's gonna help you save face. Ask me how I know. I mean, I do a ton of surgery, but once or twice in my career, I've had to make that phone call a shame, but I'm lucky. I've had a, I have a fabulous oral surgeon that knows I love to do a lot of surgery and I can rely on him for help and support. And again, if you're a Western grad, you all know Dr. Mike Shinazu. He's not just a fabulous surgeon, but he's a great guy also. So getting back to surgery, surgery needs experience. Um, and so my own story, I went to dental school in Detroit. Um, in, in Detroit, we did a ton of oral surgery. So I felt pretty confident coming out of school, but I'd never done any wisdom teeth before. And my senior doctor, he did a ton of wisdom teeth. He loved all those crazy aids that were horizontal and laying right on top of the nerve where the roots were wrapped around the nerve. And he was a champ at him. He got them out, a little lickety split with no complications and I've never seen a single case of paresthesia. So I'd watch and I learned from him how to do it. Um, and then I wanted to start getting into myself. So I would bring him a pan, I would show him a case and he'd kind of walk me through the, the, that case and guide me through the, the tips and tricks and things to watch out for. And bit by bit, I started uh, the easy ones and I gradually pushed the envelope and, and I got into doing wisdom teeth with, with a pretty high level of proficiency. And there's a huge sense of confidence that you get when you know you have your senior doctor who's right there in the office with you that you can call upon if you get stuck. I mean, that's your safety net. So if you want to eventually get into advanced surgeries and wisdom teeth, look for an associateship where the mentor is there to help you if you get stuck. So I want to turn the tables a little bit on the whole interview process for all you new grads looking for a job. So don't just look at it as that doctor interviewing and hiring you. You need to be interviewing that doctor. 
ask, ask the doctor, is there going to be mentorship? Is there going to be physical mentorship? Ask them, what areas of dentistry do you do that I can learn from? So you want to seek out those associateships where you can learn and grow in your skills from, from that mentor. And so, but if you don't have a, a mentor and you want to start taking some courses, I mean, these are some of the courses that I found um, over the years. Um, locally, there's Dr. Larry Gom. He puts one on the in GTA. You guys all saw Dr. Nikki Jamal put on, uh, put on his course. He has got a course through the Bites Academy or the Bites Institute out west. And I came across this in interesting one called the South Beach Dental Training Institute. And that's where you go. They take you, they're based in Miami. They take you to Latin America. Um, and they, you're basically spending almost a week and all you're doing are eights with a mentor and oral surgeon and you're doing it on the locals there um, and you get a ton of experience and you can pick and choose what level of difficulty of cases that you want to do. So if you don't have a, a surgical mentor, this might be a really good option for you. So ortho. What are we doing for time? Okay, we're gonna try to move a little bit more quickly. So here's one of those, um, those modalities where I wish I would have done things differently. So I missed the boat when it came to ortho and Invisalign. Um, my mentor, again, he did a ton of ortho. Um, and also his best friend was Dr. Brock Rondo. And if you don't know Dr. Rondo, he was, uh, he was and might still be the biggest game in Canada for teaching general dentists how to do ortho. And he's a general dentist himself. And so he invited me to his course and I took his full continuum of courses. It was a great program. And so then I started to dabble a little bit in ortho. And what did I learn? I learned I hated ortho, um, but I learned a lot about ortho. And so I gave it up and then Invisalign came along and I said, okay, well, let me, let me, let me take a look at that. And so I took that weekend course and Invisalign was still really new. And um, I dabbled a little bit in Invisalign. I didn't really care for it because I just had way too many limitations and it wasn't really something that I felt a general dentist um, can or should be doing. But Invisalign's evolved and it's gotten better and better and better and your patients are coming in asking for it. So I'm lucky. My best friend, Dr. Tassi, he's an orthodontist. He comes into my office and he does all my cases. But take the time to, to look at uh, Invisalign, and not just Invisalign, there are other competitors uh, that do just as well. Um, take the time to, to start looking at ortho and Invisalign because if you're going to get into full mouth dentistry, you're going to need to want to move some teeth sometimes. And um, it's going to be good if you can kind of do those simple cases. Implant dentistry. This is my passion. This is what keeps me from retiring. This is what, uh, what keeps me from uh, going further. Um, I love implants. Um, early on in my career and the office I worked at, we had a full inventory of implants. We had the motors, the tools, the instrumentation. And so in my second year of practice, I wanted to use that, uh, that stuff and I wanted to place implants. So I started watching my senior doctor placing implants and I would assist them. And so I, then they had a comprehensive, the very first uh, comprehensive six weekend live surgery and course put on by Dr. Ken Hebel. And so I took that course about 15 years ago and I've been placing implants ever since. Now, RCDS college guidelines mandate that to be able to do implants, you need to do the minimum required uh, CE to be able to um, place and restore implants. And for this, I highly recommend this is not a weekend course. And even just the minimum requirements, um, I think, are maybe a little bit lacking. If you want to get into implants, you really want to do an intense, live patient, comprehensive, multi-weekend course. Um, and so I've done many, many of them, and um, these are the ones that, uh, that I'm a big fan of. And so the Timax Institute, um, put on by Dr. Arvinitis and Dr. Uh, Dr. Rod Smith in the Kitchener-Waterloo area, um, they have the basic continuum, they have a maxi course, they have surgery, um, all, on, all on X courses, I believe, um, and then they're very good. Um, the other courses that I really enjoyed were uh, with Dr. Mark Lynn at the TIDE, they call it the Institute for Dental Excellence. And again, you'll see the photos that I show you. And we, we did, uh, I did all the advanced uh, courses there, sinus lifting, all on X, um, great, great programs. Not something that you ever want to try and do on your own after only having listened to a lecture or watched a webinar. And then Dentistry Academy, I'm going to give you guys, give you guys a little sneak uh, preview. Um, Dentistry Academy is putting together an in implant continuum um, that's going to meet and exceed college requirements to get you guys started in placing your implants. So keep your eyes out for that. Uh, a lot of the speakers you guys have been seeing in these webinars are, are experts in their field, including implants. And so if you enjoyed those speakers, you may want to hold, uh, 
hold on and uh, sign up for uh, the Dentistry Academy uh, continuum. So keep an eye out for that. And at these courses, again, look, in, look for mentors, meet mentors, develop relationships with them once the course is over. M many times I've called up some of these mentors like Dr. M um, Dr. Lynn and Dr. Arvanitis and Dr. Obaid, um, and I've called them up in the middle of their work days and I have a question or I got a, an issue or I, I, need, uh, I need something and they, they'll pick up the phone in the middle of the day. And so, so this uh, was my very, very first lateral window sinus uh, graft um, that we did. And uh, we ended up getting some really good pictures. And Dr. Azim Sheikh uh, is gonna be proud of me because you can see I got primary closure there. And you can see in the x-ray that uh, we got uh, great lift. If you can see, this was the sinus floor right here. And so we were able to do a real lift and get, get all the way up there. And so that, uh, that was a successful case. We've since placed that implant and restored it and the patient's doing great now. And then later in that very same afternoon, I did lateral window lift number two. Um, and so again, these are things that I would never attempt to do um, on my own in, in my practice without ever having done it with in a live um, in a live patient experience with a surgeon or a mentor or a course director that's really going to be there for you to kind of guide you and help you if, if a complication happens so this is me and my assistant at yet another surgery course uh, implant plant course that we did and i believe this was yes this was my very first all on x case and um, it went flawlessly. Patients uh, fully restored and doing well and happy now. We ended up even doing this full upper arch. But, uh, but yeah, this is the picture that I keep. That, uh, and that's number, my first, very first one. This here, this is my Princess Jeanine. When they say daughters have their daddies wrapped around their finger, this one absolutely does. And so I was going to Arizona last fall for an implant symposium and she asked to tag along. And so I couldn't refuse. And um, we had a great time together and uh, she sat in on a couple of seminars, but she really wasn't a fan of all the all on X uh, surgery pictures. So. We're getting close to the end. Um, number seven, technology. Are you a digital dentist? If not, you need to be. Um, I'm not gonna go too much into this because I think this is the, one of the focus of the next presentation. But you all know that this is the future of dentistry. Everyone, I mean everyone, will be using this technology. It will become the standard of care. So you have the ability to get into it now. Do so. Um, if you're an associate and your office has some of this tech, use it. Get your hands uh, comfortable with it. If you're a solo practitioner on your own, then look at getting and starting small. Get a scanner. Your odds are you're going to love it. Um, and it's probably going to inspire you to go on and get a mill. And then you may get into 3D printing and all of the applications and all of the wonderful things you can do with that. Now, keep in mind, this technology is just starting. It's in its infancy. It's going to blow up. It's growing exponentially in quality and its applications. So become an early adopter. Um, don't, don't try to play catch up years from now. If, um, so on the left here, that is, um, that's the mill and the scanner that I use. It's the Emerald by Plan Mecca and the, the Plan Scan. And I've had it for three years. I love it. Um, now I'm looking to move on. I'm looking to get a 3D printer and I'm studying, trying to figure out which one uh, to buy. On the right, you've got the, the CEREC. And, and if you want to talk to the experts on this, you've already heard uh, lectures from two of the top people in Can on that. And they are Dr. Jeff Sumner and, and Dr. Mian Quack. Go back and rewatch those seminars. Um, use them as mentors. They are um, the experts in Canada on this topic. And then lastly, comprehensive dentistry. So you've done all these courses, you're proficient in implants, you're at surgery, you're good, you can do sedation, you can do ortho, you can do molar endos now. Now you need to put it all together. These are the courses that wrap it up in a nice bow for you. These are the courses that will allow you to become that complete dentist. You take these courses, you will have so many aha moments. You'll have so many epiphanies. So many light bulbs will go off, things will come together. And you're gonna go and say, you wish you had done these courses years ago. Because when you do a weekend course or an afternoon course, or you do an individual session at the ODA, again, you leave the course with two or three little pearls. But with these courses, they are deep, they're intense. They're long in duration, but they change the way you think and practice dentistry. 
Now they're not cheap, um, but if you can get started early, um, that's the way to go. Now, if you wanna start learning some of this stuff on the cheap, the Spear Academy, they put on a phenomenal program where for $200 a month, you're getting an almost unlimited bank of continuing education for yourself, for your staff, and for your patients. And not just clinical, I'm talking about practice management, um, business management, HR, case presentation, treatment planning. Um, it is a phenomenal tool. Um, what I use probably the most is the patient education um, videos and animations. So patients love it when I can kind of show them a video. And then even better, I can email them that very same presentation and it's in their, in their inbox by the, before they get into their car. Um, and they do it in a, in a real sleek and, um, uh, and professional manner. And so I highly recommend um, these, two, um, these two schools, the Spear, Spear Academy in Arizona and Scottsdale, and uh, the Coy Center in Seattle. And so, so let's put it all together. To the class of 2020, you guys are entering a wonderful profession. Yes, you're gonna have a little bit of a, of a road, uh, of a road uh, speed bump uh, with this corona stuff, but your future is so bright. And if you take the time to reflect on what you want from dentistry and what you can do for dentistry, um, you're gonna have a beautiful, fruitful, long career. And so remember, set your goals, track your progress, and I think you'll thank me 20 years from now um, th that you made the right choice. So this is my thank you. Again, if you didn't catch my Instagram at the very beginning, I saw my phone's here right next to me and I think about 40 of you uh, just followed me. So thank you for that. Um, again, that's our Instagram, Has the Dentist, as well as Aria Dental Center. And so I hope that was beneficial uh, to some of you. Um, for some of the senior doctors here, I hope I didn't uh, cross uh, step on any toes, um, but this has been my experience and, and I'm happy to share it with some of these, uh, these, this new generation of dentists. Thank you very much and have a great day. Thank you.